श्रेष्ठ मनमपि शचिपुत्र अत्रूपम रूपम तस्कृचापुरी माचुरी गोस्तुवा राधाकुंद गिरीवर ओहराधिकस प्रक्तोयस प्रतिज कृपया श्री गुरु तम नोस् गौरव गौरचंद्रा राधिकाये कृष्णाय कृष्णा भक्ताय तद्भक्ताय नमो नम आनंदलीलमाय विग्रहाय हे मिव्यचाभि सुंदराय तस्म महाप्रेम रस प्रदाय चैतन्यचंद्रा नमो नमस्ते चैतन्यचंद्रा नमो नमस्ते चैतन्यचंद्रा नमो नमस्ते श्याम सुंदर शिखंड शिखर स्मरहा समुरली मनोरा राधिक रसक मम कृपंडित हे सुप्रिय चरण किंग करीम कुरु तवय वस्मी तवय वस्मी ना जीवा तया बना विख्याय देवी तम फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई ऑफ माई सस्तंग दंडवत पुष्पंजलि माई हार्ट लाइक फ्लावर्स थाउजेंड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स ऑफ टाइम्स एट द लोटस फीट ऑफ माई होली मास्टर माई सुप्रीमली वर्शिपल स्पिरिचुअल गुरुदेव अस्मदीय परम राजतम गुरु पार पद्म नित्य लीला प्रविष्ट ओम विष्णुपाद अष्टोतर सतसी रूपानुगाचार्य वर्य शील भक्ति वेदांत नारायण गोस्वामी महाराज सेकेंडली आई ऑफ माई प्रणाम थाउजेंड्स ऑफ टाइम्स एट द लोट इज फीट ऑफ माई परम गुरुदेव टू श्रील प्रभुपाद एन ऑल अब श्री रूपानुग गौड गुड गुरु परंपरा एंड फाइनली आई ऑफ माई प्रणाम to all the viewers all the assembled devotees vaishnavas and vaishnavis around the world my pranam to you vancha kalpatru dasya kripa sindhu bevacha putitanam pavane bio vaishnavi bio namo namo so last week we completed uh the our discussion on chapter 9 of bhagavad gita which is entitled rajaguya yoga the yoga of the king of secrets now we're coming to chapter 10 here in chapter 10 which is entitled vibhuti yoga the sri bhagavan uvacha sri krishna himself is speaking buya eva mahabaho sunume paramam vachah yatte ham priyamanaya वक्षा कृष्ण इज सही ओ महाबाहु परी दट मीन्स एन एड्रेस टू अर्जुन हु हेज वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग आर्म्स ही इज अ ग्रेट बोरिय भूया श्रृणु अगेन हियर माई इंस्ट्रक्शंस परमाम बचा which are superior to what i have spoken previously vakshami hitakamaya i will speak why hitakamaya because i desire your benefit i desire your ultimate welfare and i will reveal this knowledge to you why yatteham priyamanaya because you have love for me you consider me to be your most dear person priyamanaya therefore i am speaking this to you now what is the inner sentiment of sri krishna in speaking these words 
in chapter 7 uh, and 8 and especially the previous chapter chapter 9 see Krishna has been explaining bhakti tattva the principle of devotion along with the description of his Aishwarya feature that is of his opulence Aishwarya means that he is Ishwara Ishwara means he has the Ishi he has capability he has the um, controlling power over all aspects of existence so Bhakti Tattva has been described previously the principle of devotion along with Sri Krishna's opulences especially the vibhutis the, the, the word vibhuti means uh, opulence or opulent manifestations so this uh, vibhutis have been described especially in chapter 7 verses 8 to 12 and in chapter 9 verses 16 to 19 now the bhakti tattva which was described before in other words the description of devotion along with Krishna's opulences is also known as Bhagavad Vibhuti and now this Bhagavad Vibhuti is being expanded upon here in chapter 10 along with its confidential meaning it's not what people in general consider it to be so let's expand on that point a little more the point is this that when the devotees listen to the description of Sri Krishna's Aishwarya feature Krishna's the opulences of Krishna's form then this awakens Krishna's form in in other words the description causes Krishna's form to manifest as a spurti a vision within the heart of the devotee and that vision by that vision it is revealed that see Krishna himself in his personal and human like form is the supreme object of knowledge and the supreme object of everyone's worship because sometimes it's considered that uh, Brahman the all-pervading light is to be worshipped and that's the highest truth or sometimes it's considered that Paramatma the forearm form of Lord Vishnu in the heart of every living being in every atom and so on uh, these are the ultimate truth but by hearing about Bhakti Tattva along with the Bhagavad Vibhuti the opulences of the Lord it causes Sri Krishna's personal two-handed human-like form to appear within the heart of the devotee and the devotee realizes that though this human-like form of Krishna seems uh, to be simple and human-like and very close to us but that very human-like form is the supreme absolute truth and is the object of worship for everyone so see Krishna has said in Srimad Bhagavatam in the 11th canto Paraksha Vada Rishayaha Paraksham Mamacha Priyam which means that uh, the sages in their sayings and in Vedic literature they speak in an indirect way that is called Parakshavad not a direct expression but an indirect expression uh, which is uh, concealing the true meaning of their words to persons who are not really initiated into the tradition to those who are not qualified specifically that means to those whose hearts are devoid of bhakti 
of devotion. So Krishna says, Praksha'am Mamacha Priyam. And not only the Rishi speak in Parokshavad, an indirect way, but that indirect way of speaking is very dear to me. And by this, Krishna means to say that the way that the Rishis describe me is pleasing to me. And it also means that Krishna himself, it is his habit to speak in Parokshavad, to speak in a way that what he's saying appears to be one thing to those who have the uh, no bhakti, but the true nature of what Krishna is saying becomes apparent and revealed with great wonder within the hearts of the devotees. So, for this reason, Krishna here in the first verse is saying, Bhuya Eva Mahabahu. Bhuya means again, I'm going to tell you again. And the implication is that I have just spoken Raja Guya, the king of all secrets. So someone may say, well, if you've spoken it now, everyone knows it. It's not a secret. <laughs> but no, Krishna is saying, I have spoken this secret in such a way that those who are devoid of bhakti won't understand, actually. And therefore, uh, my speaking is, is uh, parokshavad. And so now Krishna say, I'm going to speak it again. And again, when Krishna will speak it, it will also be um, unintelligible uh, to those who are not in the path of bhakti, or those in the path of bhakti will think that in, it's intelligible, but they will understand it in a wrong way. For example, if Krishna will say, I am the taste of water, I am the light of the sun and the moon, and so on, then they'll think, oh, the real message of the Bhagavad Gita is some sort of pantheism, where the highest realization is to just look around you and see that God is in everything. Mm. But that's not Krishna's intention at all. So Krishna's saying, Bhūya, now I'm going to speak this again. Why? Because this uh, indirect expression is extremely beautiful. And those who are absorbed in bhakti, if they hear it once, then they have some realization. And now Krishna will explain that secret again in a different way. And by hearing it, then this purti, that is the vision of Krishna's beauty, the vision of Sri Krishna's uh, divine Swarup will become more and more firmly shining and manifest within their heart and their devotion will n be nourished, their devotion will grow. Uh, so, in the Sandarbhas there, Srila Jiva Goswami gives an explanation of, of this phrase Parokshavad. So Parokshavad means when a person knows a secret and they keep that knowledge secret because it is very exalted because it is extremely rare because it's so precious and valuable they keep that secret it is something which is not to be given freely to all but then they explain it but they explain it in an indirect way so that unqualified persons won't understand, then that is called Parokshavad. So Parokshavad is the nature of the Vedas, and it's also the nature of Bhagavan, Sri Krishna himself. It's his nature to keep himself hidden. So this is something uh, really important to know about Sri Krishna's character. In Chaitanya Charamrita, there, Sila Krishna Skavaraj Goswami, he speaks on this topic. He says, Apana lukaite Krishna, nana yatna kare, tata pita hara bhakta, janayeta hare. Apana lukaite Krishna. It's very beautiful. It means that Krishna, nana yatna kare, he tries, he endeavors in various ways to hide himself. <laughs> if someone is thinking, well, where is God? I can't see God. And well, the answer is yes, he's hiding. And that's his nature. He hides himself. Tathapi tahara bhakta jane tahari. However, 
His devotees, those who have love in their hearts, only they can find Him. Hmm. For example, we see that when Krishna was a small baby, Bala Krishna, and uh, his mother was feeding him breast milk, but then she saw that the milk uh, on the stove was boiling over. So even though Krishna still wanted to drink, his appetite wasn't satisfied. Mother Yashoda put Krishna down and she went to take care of the milk. Then Krishna became uh, quite indignant and wanted to uh, express his displeasure by smashing a pot in the kitchen. So, see, Krishna took uh, a stone pestle for grinding spices and he smashed the clay pot that was full of yogurt that Madhya Yashoda had been uh, churning to make butter. And when he smashed the pot, uh, he, it made a hole in the bottom and therefore, due to the pressure, then the yogurt came spraying out all over the kitchen. But when Krishna saw that, he was overjoyed and he clapped his hands. But then the next moment he thought, oh, when my mother comes and sees this mess that I've made, then she'll want to punish me. So I should immediately run and hide. So then Krishna, he ran and he hid himself in a, a storeroom. In the meantime, Madhya Shoda returned and saw the mess that Krishna made. And then she thought, where did my boy go? And she noticed that even though Sri Krishna wanted to hide himself from Madhya Yashoda, but because being a child and having a childish intelligence due to the being overpowered by the love of Madhya Yashoda, Krishna forgets that he's Bhagavan. He thinks he's just an ordinary baby. Hmm? So Krishna didn't think that if I walk through the yogurt and then hide, then I will leave yogurty footprints across the kitchen leading directly to where I'm hiding. So here's an example of how uh, Krishna tried to hide but Madhya Shoda saw the yogurt footprints of Krishna and immediately could locate him. So this is Krishna's nature that God hides himself from everyone but he cannot hide himself from his devotees. The power of their love causes him to be caught red-handed in any of his hidden activities. Even in the Rasalila, see Krishna, he disappears, he hides from Brajagopis. But when Radhika, weeping, she calls, Yatte sujatu charnam buruham Oh, I cannot, if I cannot serve you, then what is the use of my life? Let me give up my life now and that, let the remainder of my life be added to yours, Krishna, that you can have long and happy life in Vrindavan. And when Sri Krishna saw this, he could not check himself. And immediately from his hiding place, he came running there and appeared in the midst of the Brajagopis. Hmm? Once in Rasalila, Krishna was hiding and he manifested a four-armed Narayan form uh, to hide himself. But when Radharani came and uh, saw him, then two arms disappeared and the Narayan form was no longer present, just Krishna's sweet form of Shama Sundar with two hands uh, was seen by Radhika. So we see again and again in Krishna's Leela, this is his nature. He is very playful. He likes to play hide and seek and he successfully hides from those who have no devotion. But for those who have love, then Krishna always gets caught and he cannot hide from them. So, just as Sri Krishna's personality and his Swarup is like this, playful, likes to hide but gets caught by his devotee. So similarly, the words of Krishna, they are the Vanmai Murti. They are the sound incarnation of Krishna. They are Krishna's Swarup in the form of sound. So the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the words of Krishna, being Krishna himself, have the same characteristics of Sri Krishna. This answers the question, sometimes you're reading Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, you think, what does that mean? It seems as if Krishna is being deliberately um, abstruse. And the answer is yes, he is. That's his nature. He's playful, he hides himself, and only when we hear these words, 
from the lips of a pure devotee, in the association of a pure devotee, ourselves being fully dedicated by mod body, mind and words to the path of devotion, then those very words which were previously hiding Krishna serve to reveal directly his transcendental swarup. And I don't mean reveal theoretically what Krishna is saying, but to actually reveal Krishna standing there, smiling and glancing mercifully upon his devotee. The words actually reveal Krishna himself. And uh, that is what, why see Krishna is saying now, I've told you the greatest secret and now I'm going to tell you it again. And why it looks like a description of opulence, but it's actually not, the idea is not that we should think, oh, uh, when we see a shark, yes, Krishna is the, is, a, is amongst fish, is the shark. When we see the Himalayas, yes, uh, these are, the Himalayas are a manifestation of Krishna's opulence. This is not the point. The point is that when these words are spoken by his devotee and heard by those who have devotion, then an intense spurti of the human-like sweet form of Krishna is manifest in the heart and one's devotion is nourished. And then from there one can make the transition to being fully absorbed in the sweetness and forgetting the opulence. And actually that opulence is not forgotten willfully by the devotee, but as his dedication to Krishna in a particular relationship and mood becomes stronger, as he becomes more and more aware, more and more realized in the sweetness of Krishna, then that sweetness of Krishna makes the devotee become so intoxicated that he forgets about the opulences. So it's not something, that transition from Krishna's being awareness, aware of Krishna's opulence to only being aware of his sweetness is a natural uh, process that takes place by the very intoxicating nature of Sri Krishna's sweetness which is revealed in the association of those devotees on the path of Ruga, Raganuga Bhakti to those who are in the Anugatya under the guidance of those devotees on the path of Raganuga Bhakti devotion to Krishna in his human-like form in Vrindavan. <coughs> so, now we see in the first line here, Bhuya Eva, I'm speaking this again, Mahabaho. So Krishna is addressing Arjun as Mahabahu. That means, uh, Bahu means arms, and Mahu means great, indicating Arjun's a powerful warrior with strong arms. And uh, so, here, the meaning is that, hey Arjun, just as on the battlefield, in previous battles and in previous fights, you have demonstrated the superiority of your physical strength. So similarly, now you should demonstrate the superiority of your intelligence by very submissively and carefully listening. So here uh, Krishna is saying Mahabahu Srinu. That means now you should listen. Hear the word Srinu. Hear what you are, uh, uh, I am speaking is an order of Krishna. And in the, in the order of Krishna and in the order of Guru is a Shakti to fulfill that order. So if Krishna says to Arjun, Pasyame Yoga Maisram, look at my mystic opulence, what he's actually saying is, if you are surrendered to me, when I say, look, I'm giving you the power to realize it. So here, see Krishna is saying, Srinu, listen, and by listening, you'll have the power to realize my words and the power to retain everything that I'm saying. Hmm. This is very important. If we hear something, but we don't retain it, then it's not counted as hearing. Uh, that hearing that goes in one ear and out of the other is not hearing. Hmm. So, and the same is true for reading and so on. 
if we're reading, but after reading we don't remember, then from the paramartic perspective, from the spiritual perspective, it's to be considered that we didn't read. We have not read. So if we hear and we don't retain it, then it's to be understood that we've not heard. So here Krishna is saying, Srinu, listen, mm. and that I am empowering you, that you'll remember these nectarian words. So Krishna is saying, Bahu eva maha bahu srinu mei paramambacha. Krishna is saying that uh, this is my uh, highest or most auspicious instruction. So one may say that, that the Raja Guya, the topmost speak, secret was spoken in the previous chapter. So is this higher? Um, it's the same subject. So in one sense it's not higher, but then again it is higher because Krishna is continuing to speak on the same subject. The more you hear, 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 become clear, clear, clear. As one goes on hearing, then the nectar becomes sweeter, the realizations become deeper. Mm. Now, it's very interesting here in the Sanskrit. See, Krishna is saying, Yate Priyamanaya Hitakamyaya. Krishna is using the dative case. So, uh, there's a rule in the um, grammar, Panini's Astadhyayi, Sanskrit grammar, that says, Kritata. Papadasya karmani which means the dative case, te, unto you, is used to denote the object of a missing verb element. In other words, because the dative case is used here, I will speak unto you, the dative is used, and that indicates there's, there's a verb missing. So, our acharyas say that this implies that I will speak this knowledge to you to astonish you, to make you become struck with wonder, to make you uh, tremble with amazement. And as if when I'm speaking, it will be as if you are drinking nectar and you will tremble with ecstasy. So, we see that here in this verse, Krishna is introducing the Bhagavad Vibhuti, the, the Vibhuti Yoga, the Yoga of realizing His Rup internally by listening to a uh, description of bhakti mixed with his opulences. And the result of that is what? The realization of his swarup and a very clear establishment of the consciousness. Oh Krishna, you are the exclusive object to be worshipped by everyone. So, in the uh, pastimes of Krishna in Vrindavan, when Lord Brahma came to Vrindavan and tried to steal away the coward boys, then we see that after Sri Krishna manifested his opulences to Lord Brahma, then Brahma offered prayers and he said this very thing, No midya te brava poseita di dambaraya, gunjava tanksa paripichala sanmukaya, vanyastra jay kavala vetra vichana venu, Jaya. Oh my Lord, this very form of yours as a coward boy with soft lotus feet, walking barefoot in the forest of Gokul, with a peacock feather in your hair, decorated with earrings and gunja berries, holding uh, a, f a flute in your belt and a stick for herding the cows and a buffalo horn bugle with some rice and fruit in your left hand mm. with a complexion like a fresh rain cloud and a cross like a flash of lightning this very beautiful human-like form as a coward boy no midyate that very form is the supreme object of worship for all living beings. Mm. 
So in this pastime, there is the example of Brahmaji witnessing the opulences of Krishna and then realizing his simple human cowherd boy form, Gopavesha Natavara. Mm -hmm. That cowherd boy form of Krishna is the supreme object of worship of everyone. So now in verse 2, we'll come back to Brahma later. He has some very wonderful things to say on this topic. And that will be uh, Brahma's prayers will be implied now in the second verse. See, Krishna is saying, Nam evidu sura ganaha prabhavam na maharshayaha aham adihi devanam maharshinam chasaravashaha. Krishna said, The devatas, that means the great demigods, and the great rishis, the sages, do not know my prabhav. Hmm? So prabhav here has a number of meanings. One meaning is they do not know the extent of my unlimited extraordinary powers. Hmm? And the word prabhav can also mean appearance. That means they do not understand the inconceivable nature of my appearance pastimes in this world. And here Krishna is saying, Aham Adihi Devana Mahashi Namcha Sarvasha. And what's the reason that the great demigods and the rishis don't understand? Krishna said, Because I am the source of the devatas and I am the source of the rishis. So, what is Krishna's mood in this verse? What is he implying? Now, an ordinary ignorant person in this world, for them many things are unknown, even simple things and common things are unknown. But great demigods have vast intelligence, they have vast sensory powers, and sages have the ability to go in trance. They're situated in a high level of sattva gun, from which gyan, the discrimination, automatically arises. So when Krishna is saying that the devatas and the rishis don't understand the extent of my opulences or they don't realize the transcendental nature of my appearance, what Krishna is actually saying is that my tattva, my truth cannot be understood by any means. Not by great intelligence, not by austerities, not by sattvagun, not by discrimination. My reality can be understood only by my mercy. I am understood to whom I reveal myself by my grace. This is the implication here. Because uh, persons can know more and more depending on their qualification. And the devatas are more qualified than the human beings. And the rishis are more qualified than many of the devatas. Eh? But still they cannot know. Then how can he be known? He cannot be known. He's known only by his mercy. And that's why, see Krishna is speaking this verse, Na mei vidu suragana prabhavam na mahashayaha. So, now, mama prabhavam. Prabhav can mean influence. But Srila Vishnu Tavitaku, he focuses on the, the meaning of appearance. In other words, even the demigods do not understand this in extraordinary tattva of my being born. Simultaneously appearing uh, in the prison cell of Kamsa as the son of Devaki and Vasudev and simultaneously being born as a natural child from the womb of Yashoda in <coughs> Gokul, in Braja. So these types of mysteries, even the demigods and the rishis, they don't understand these things. This is what Sri Krishna is saying here. So, the facts of Krishna's birth, how he appeared in a four-handed form in the prison cell of Kamsa, 
Then Devaki and Vasudev pl prayed, please become like a natural child. Then from the four-handed form he became in the two-handed form. And then Vasudev Maharaj carried him to Gokul. And then that form of Krishna entered into the original form, two-handed form, that is Yashoda Nandan Krishna. Uh, so all these secrets, they are hidden from the demigods, they are hidden from the rishis. That's what Sri Krishna is stating here. And someone may say, here the Sanskrit word is Prabhav, and the prominent meaning of Prabhav is, though it can mean appearance, but the main meaning is influence. So in regard to that, Srila Vishnu Charitako said, well, look, after hearing this description from Krishna, then Arjun, who is full of devotion, hearing directly and undoubtedly realizing uh, what Krishna is saying, in verse 14, just 12 verses later, Arjun will be the witness and testify what Krishna means. He says, Sarvam itadritam manye yanman badasi keshava nahite bhagavan vyaktim vidur devanadanava Hey Keshav Krishna, I fully accept as true all that you have told me. O Bhagavan, neither the devatas, all the asuras, the demons, the demigods, and even the rishis, they cannot understand Bhagavan Vyaktim. That means your appearance in this world. So the similar words that Krishna is speaking in this verse are repeated by Arjun later. And Arjun specifically says this refers to the mysterious nuances of Sri Krishna's appearance pastime. Mm -hmm. So, another meaning here, when Krishna said the Devas don't understand, that means Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva even, and Lord Indra. And when he says the Rishis, he's referring to the Sanat Kumar and the four Kumaras they don't understand my appearance and of course also it can mean my opulences that means even though they understand something they have some realization but they can never come to the end of that, those unlimited opulences they can never fully realize so Krishna is saying they cannot understand my unlimited dazzling forms my unlimited, uncountable qualities. They cannot understand my powers because only when they see them or even if they think about them, then it makes them become dizzy. <laughs> so, mm. what to speak of the uh, Devatas <laughs> becoming dizzy upon seeing Sri Krishna's powers? Even the Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu being Krishna himself, when he was describing the opulences and the sweetness of Krishna to uh, Srila Sanatan Goswami, he said, Eimata anyata nahi shunye adbhut ta sravana chitte malohayadut The meaning is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had been explaining how Krishna had bewildered Lord Brahma. You know that mm, Lord Brahma has been overwhelmed by the opulence of Sri Krishna in uh, several occasions. For example, once Krishna was in Dwarka and Lord Brahma came to see him. And uh, when he came to the door, the doorman said, oh, please uh, tell me who are you? He said, my name is Brahma. Then the doorman said, which Brahma are you? And Brahma said, Chatul Mukha Brahma, the um, secondary creator of the universe. So then the doorman said, just wait. And then he, he went away. After some time, then the doorman allowed Lord Brahma to come into the royal palace of Krishna in Dwarka, where Sri Krishna was seated on a throne. So at that time, Brahmaji, he was wondering, why did he say which Brahma? I am unique. They, in the whole universe, there's only one Brahma. Hmm? So then Krishna knew this, so he just smiled at Lord Brahma and as he smiled, then he began to manifest the waves of his opulence and Brahma saw many Brahmas coming like a swarm of bees. 
Hmm? Thousands and thousands of Brahmas, some of them with 8 heads, 16 heads, 32 heads, 64 heads, 128 heads, 1000 heads, 10,000 heads, and 10 million heads. Brahma himself was very minute compared to them. And he saw all these powerful Brahmas coming. And simultaneously they were bowing down at the feet of Sri Krishna. And when the jewels on the tips of their crowns touched the ground at Krishna's lotus feet, it made a tremendous cacophony. <coughs> And Krishna glanced at all those Brahmas and said, Is everything uh, well auspicious in your universe? And then the Brahmas, they acknowledged and they bowed before Krishna. And then, by your blessings, my Lord, all is auspicious. And then those Brahmas disappeared. So Lord Brahma was mm, struck with wonder. Mm. We see mm, that... Uh, Lord Brahma also when he came to Vrindavan and tried to steal Krishna's boys and friends he could not steal them but Krishna had the pastime of expanding himself and becoming all the coward boys and all the calves for one year so when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was describing these powers to Sanatana Goswami he said this e mat, mat nahi shuni adbut. you cannot hear of such tremendous opulence anywhere hmm? in any demigod in any form of God or even in any form of God outside of Vrindavan such opulence was never manifest in any other Leela as this very cute and beautiful charming little coward boy with peacock feather in his hair running around barefoot in the forest sometimes afraid of his mother that his mother may chastise him that this little boy has manifested such opulences it's never been seen or heard of any, anywhere before and simply by hearing it sravana chitta mal hoy dut that means that simply when you hear the opulences of Krishna then the mal contamination within the heart becomes washed away completely washed away and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said to Sanatana Goswami Oh, now I am in the middle of the ocean of Krishna's opulences and I can see no end in any direction and only seeing these vast opulences I am becoming bewildered hmm? because Mahaprabhu is trying to speak Harikata to Sanatana Goswami so when a person is speaking Harikata actually the realization is coming in their heart and then manifesting on their tongue in the form of Harikata that is real Harikata. So Mahaprabhu is not memorizing anything or whatever. He, he's actually, as he speaks, he begins to speak and realization comes. And then what is realizing? It's coming from his mouth. So now Mahaprabhu had begun to describe the vast opulences of Krishna. What he was seeing was so incredible. In all directions, he didn't know what to speak next to Sanatana Goswami. He was at a loss for words. Mm. So, uh, we're discussing here how uh, Krishna is saying in this verse of Bhagavad Gita, the demigods and the rishis, they cannot know me. Mm. That means that even if they have some realization of my opulence, but still they don't know me. Uh, and if they see something of my opulence, they become completely dizzy and bewildered. And even Krishna himself in the form of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu becomes dizzy and bewildered. In fact, then Mahaprabhu, uh, within the ocean of the opulence of Krishna that he was realizing, then the sweetness of Krishna began to rise up within the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he said to Sanatana Goswami, Yan matili lo paikaswa yoga maya balam darshayita grihitam. Vishmapadam swasya chasobagade paramparam bhushna bhushnangam. Ah, this human like form of Krishna is so sweet and so attractive that when he's decorated with ornaments by his mother, or when he's decorated by ornaments by his friends, the coward boys, or when he's decorated with ornaments by the gopis of Vrindavan then those ornaments don't make Krishna more beautiful. His beauty makes the ornaments more beautiful how is that it's impossible to be so beautiful the answer is yes hmm? 
this form of Krishna which is exactly suited to playing Marchalila like a mortal human being. Yoga mayam maya balam dashaita. This is the showing the power of Yoga Maya. That means that Yoga Maya, Agatana Gatana Patiasi Shakti, the power to make the impossible possible, the inconceivable potency of the Lord. The full power of Yoga Maya is there in revealing to the world this sweet boy, Krishna in Vrindavan. That is the full manifestation of the power of Yoga Maya. This form of the human-like form of Krishna, his qualities and his pastimes, especially in Rasa Lila, Yoga Maya Mupasvitaha. Mm-hmm. This is the full manifestation of Krishna's power to make the impossible possible. So, mm-hmm. here, Uddhavji is saying, Vismapanam Swasya Chasobhagade that this form of Krishna is so beautiful that it's even astonishing to himself. It's even astonishing to himself. So, for example, in the Brahman Vimohan Lila, <laughs> we see that uh, Krishna was playing in the form of m- many coward boys, all of his friends. But then as Brahma looked on, then each of the coward boys manifested as a forearm form of Lord Narayan. Now in Vaikuntha, uh, the associates of the Lord have forearm forms just like him. But each one of these forearm forms had the mark of uh, Srivats on the chest and the Kostuba money, which meant these were not Krishna's or Lord Narayan's Vaikuntha associates, but each and every one of them was Lord Narayan himself. Mm-hmm. And so, where it is, we would have said, Vismapanam Swasya Chasobhagade. This form of Krishna in Vrindavan is so beautiful that even Krishna himself, that means Krishna's expansions become astonished. That means that not only was Brahma amazed seeing this, but when Krishna manifested a Narayan form as each cow and coward boy, then all those Narayan forms themselves, they saw the beautiful coward boy form of Krishna in Vrindavan and Vismapadam Swasyata Sobhagade, the Narayan forms, Krishna's own expansions, became shocked, struck with wonder, seeing Krishna's human-like sweetness. So all the opulence is there, but the full sweetness is there, which is so charming that the devotees who follow the mood of Braja, they drown in that ocean of sweetness and they cannot experience any of the um, uh, opulence. They, they're not interested. Their intelligence never does anusandan. They never, even if Krishna will show opulence to them, their intelligence never investigates it to wonder, well, is that possible for an ordinary boy to lift a hill on his little finger for seven days? Mm? When they're seeing Krishna, they never wonder about it. Later in separation, the question may arise in the older gopis and they can ask this question to Nanda Maharaj. But uh, among the gopis and uh, the coward boys and uh, indeed among all bridge basses when they're actually seeing lifting Govardhan Hill, that question, that Anusandan never arises. So the Madhurya Bhav, the feeling of love for Krishna as a natural relationship, you're my friend, you're my son, you're my sweetheart, is so intense. Uh, Swasambandha Sabhalya. It's so, that relationship is so intense that it makes Anusandan Abhav, that is the complete absence of investigation <laughs> to whether an ordinary boy can do these superhuman feats or not. So, we see also that uh, once there was a, a Brahmin and he complained to Krishna in Mathura that he it had. Uh, nine children and then it all disappeared on birth and Arjun vowed I'll protect your tenth child but the tenth child also disappeared so then in order to find those children then Krishna and Arjun traveled on a chariot beyond the heavenly planets beyond the coverings of the universe and they came to the huge form of Mahavishnu lying in the causal ocean and Mahavishnu said to them 
Drijatma Drijatma Ja May Yuvayo Dridikshuna. Actually, I have stolen these boys, and the reason I stole these boys is because I wanted to see you. <laughs> so Mahavishnu is expansion, expansion, expansion of Krishna. But even Mahavishnu is up to some tricks and traps just to get the chance to have the darshan of Krishna. So Vismapanam Swasya Chasobagade Param Param Bhushna Bhushnangam that even Krishna's own expansions become astonished by his beauty. So what to speak of uh, the 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 dizzy the dizziness of the minds of the great of Lord Brahma, the great Devatas and Rishis. Uh, they cannot understand him and if by mercy he will reveal himself, then they become astonished. So it is also said in the uh, original uh, Vedas that for example in the fourth verse of the Sri Ishupanishad, there the Lord says, Naina Deva Apnuvam Puravam Arshat that means Naina Deva Apnuvan. The Supreme Personality of Godhead cannot be attained by the demigods. Why? Puravam Arshat. That means that he existed before them. So that's very that's the same point that Krishna is saying in this verse of the Gita. The Gita is called Gita Upanishad. It's the essence of all the Upanishads. So you'll find that whatever is explained in the Upanishads, it will also be there in the words of Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna is saying, the Rishis, the Devas, they cannot know me because I am their origin. And that's something very important to know. Um, for example, a child is born, but that child who is born cannot know about the origin of his father mm -hmm. because it was before he was born. So in the same way, see Krishna is eternal, he has no beginning, but the Devas and Rishis have a beginning in this world. And so they cannot know about the origin of that which appeared before their origin. And it is not only that, but see Krishna is sort of Atit, he's beyond everything, he is Indriya Atit, he's beyond the senses, Krishna is Sarva Ashray, he's the shelter of everything. So we cannot apply the same criteria for knowing something to that which is categorically different from all the objects that we know. All the objects that we know in this world, they have a beginning. They are, they are not self-manifest. Uh, they are not beyond our senses. They are not uh, the foundation of all other existence. And therefore, the methods by which we know the things of this world, those methods simply do not apply to knowing that being who is the shelter of all existence and the origin of everything. So, uh, that should be uh, quite obvious and apparent. But still, proud people wander around saying, oh, there's no proof of God. Essentially, they're making a category mistake by, uh, and they're just s saying that the techniques that I use to understand physical created things fail when it comes to understanding that which is the origin of all the physical and created things. Uh, so now Krishna being unknowable by any material method Krishna being known by bhakti, Krishna's nature, apana lukaya, I hide myself, but Krishna's being discoverable by his devotee has been expressed very, very um, beautifully by the great saint Yamuna Charya in his Stotra Ratna. And uh, This verse is also quoted by Sri Krishna Karaj Goswami in the third chapter of Adi Lila Chaitanya Charita. There he says, Ulangita Trivita Simma Samati Shai Sambhava Nam Twayapari Vradima Subhavam Maya Balena Bhavatapi Nigu Yamanam Pasyanti Keti Danisham Twadananya Bhavaha. 
Ulangita Trividha Simha. It means, O oh my Lord, you exist beyond the three Vidasimha. You transcend, you transgress, you extend beyond three Vidasimha. That means three types of limitation. And what are those three types of limitation? My Lord, you're beyond time, you are beyond space, and you are beyond the uh, thought, the capacity of thought. Why? Because the, our intelligence is a mature element, and the mature element of intelligence is a product of a hankar, ego, in the mode of passion. So it's not surprising that a person, by the application of intelligence, cannot understand God, because they are simply taking shelter of a rajasic transformation of ego to understand that which is beyond rajas and beyond ego. So all intellectual, intellectual and empirical investigations are uh, systemically defective in regard to theological uh, principles. So my Lord, you are Ulangita Trivida Singha, you go beyond the three limitations of time, space and thought. Mm -hmm. Your characteristics are unequaled and unsurpassed. Sometimes, here, Maya Balena Bhavatapi Niguya Manu, you uh, cover your characteristics by your own energy. Yoga Maya, uh, uh, Yoga Maya Upasritaha. Sorry. <laughs> Yoga Maya Samavrita. See, Krishna said, I am not visible to everyone because I am covered by my own Yoga Maya energy, or I am, uh, I am covered. Sometimes Krishna conceals himself from his devotees by Yoga Maya and conceals himself from the non devotees by his Mahamaya, material energy. He said, But here, Yamunacharya is saying, But nevertheless, your pure devotees are always able to see you under all circumstances. In other words, though Krishna hides himself, but his devotees catch him by the power of their love, because Krishna is controlled by love. Hmm? So, here in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is saying, now may, now may we do Suraga Ganaha Pravava Me Maharshaya. I am not understood by the great demigods and rishis and so on. So, Lord Brahma also, he, when he was offering prayers to Sri Krishna after he'd become bewildered, he said, Koveti Bhu Man Bhagavan Paratman Yogeshwaro Tir Bhavatastri Lokyam which means, O oh my Lord, Master of Mystic Power, hmm? no one can understand where you will appear, how you will appear, hmm? to what extent you will appear, or when you will appear. So we read, the Srimad Bhagavatam and we see in the different ages the Supreme Lord appears. Sometimes he appears from a stone pillar as Lord Nishingadev. Sometimes he appears from the nose of Lord Brahma. It was a, a big surprise to Lord Brahma in the form of Varahadev. And now he appeared in, in Vrindavan to Lord Brahma and he'd become all the boys and calves. So no one can say uh, though we read it and we know it, but actually, it's whenever Krishna appears, it's a big surprise to everyone how he will appear, when he will appear, to what extent he will appear, and when he will appear. Who can know? No one can know. Only these things are known to the devotees by their bhakti. So, interestingly, Sila Bhakti no Thakur in his commentary on this verse of Bhagavad Gita, he quotes uh, some verses which have been spoken by uh, Narad Muni to King Prachinabahi. So let's have 
a look at these verses that Srila Bhaktinath Thakur is quoting. It's a uh, Canto 4, chapter 29, verse 42, 43, and 44. Uh, and there, Marichi it atri angiraso pulastya pulaha kratu brigo vishista ityeti. All the different sages are being mentioned. Bra Narad Muni is saying, O oh, uh, omniscient Brahma, father of all the demigods, uh, he does not know. Shiva, Manu, Daksha, and the rulers of humankind, the four Kumaras, the great sages such as Marichi, Atri, Brigu, Palastya, Pulaha, Kratu, and, and Narada says, and also I. Even though we know all the Vedas and we are Vachaspati, that means we have the mm, Patutta expertise at vat, uh, Vachaha, at speaking. We're very expert at speaking on all the Vedas. But even though uh, we reflect upon the Supreme Lord and we perform austerities and we study the, the Gyan and we do meditation, concentration, but still we cannot see that Supreme Lord who Himself is seeing everything. Mm. And Nard Muni says, to this day we cannot see Him. So, what does this mean? First of all, it means that the Supreme Lord is Vibhu, He is unlimited, and every soul is Anu, atomic, infinitesimal, very, very small. So what do power does the Anu, the atomic consciousness, have to know the Vibhu, the unlimited consciousness? unless the unlimited consciousness will reveal himself to the atomic consciousness by his mercy. And that mercy comes to those who engage in devotion to Krishna. Hmm. So, now one may raise the question that Narad saying, I don't know Krishna. Brahma doesn't know Krishna. And all the great sages like mm, Angira and um, Brigu and the Shish, they don't know Krishna. So we know from the many pastimes in the Puranas and especially Srimad Bhagavatam, Ramayan, Mahabharata, and so on, that these sages actually participate in Krishna's pastimes. So there's a sense in which they know him, but they don't know him fully. And why is Narad saying that we don't know him? Because Narad Muni is overwhelmed with love. And it's the nature of love that Premara Swabhava Jaha Premara Sambandha Semani Krishna More Nahi Prema Ganda. The nature of love is such that the person's heart is trembling and feels like I have no love. I am not really a devotee. So Nard Muni is saying that all these persons, Brahma and Shiva, and himself even, though they have some realization, he's saying, Oh, we don't know Krishna, and especially I don't know Krishna. And Narada is saying, though I study the Vedas, though I am learned, though I can give very clever, uh, ingenious discourses, and although uh, I engage in austerities and study the philosophy and practice meditation, I still don't know him. The implication is, Narada is saying, oh, alas, alas, we are not really bhaktas. I am not really a devotee. I am just a dry jnani. I do austerities. I try to know him by meditation, concentration, and philosophical analysis uh, because I am not really a devotee. So don't misunderstand this verse. On the one hand, it, he's saying the same as Krishna is saying in this verse of Bhagavad Gita the rishis and the devas don't know me. Uh, but on the other hand, Narada is also, this is also an expression of his love and in that love there's humility in that humility there's self-criticism and so we have to uh, understand something of the, the bhav of Narada as well and not take it entirely literally mm. So Srila Bhaktino Thakur 
also in his commentary he is quoting an important verse from the prayers of Lord Brahma Atapite deva padam bujam dvaya prasadaleshanu greeta eva hi janati tatvam bhagavam mahimno na chanya ekopi chiram vichinvan hmm? and this is really bringing out the essence of this verse of Bhagavad Gita Brahmaji is saying that Janati Tattvam Bhagavan Mahim no Nachanya Ekopi Chiran Vichinvan. If someone studies the Vedas for a very long time, they cannot know you, Krishna. Atap ite deva padambu jam twaya prasada leshanu griva eta eva hi means but if someone is favored by a lesh, that means a scent, a slight trace of your mercy then they can know Bhagavad Tattva that Krishna of Braja this beautiful coward boy he is the supreme absolute truth and so it's not a question of learning it's a question of Anugraha a question of Prasad Prasad Alesha a trace of mercy so when a person in their life they have the opportunity to meet with Sadhguru meet with a pure devotee and very kindly he mm, puts in their ear the nectar of Krishna Kirtan the nectar of Harikatha the nectar of Hare Krishna Mahamantra Gopa Mantra all of these things then by being touched by a trace of Sri Krishna's mercy through Sadhu Sangha then only then a person can become relieved from the influence of illusion and understand ha ah, Bhagavad Tattva see Krishna of Vrindavan is Swayam Bhagavan Ete Changsa Kala Pungsam Krishna's Pungsa Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam mm. so uh, this is the uh, essence of these uh, verses of Bhagavad Gita that Krishna has Achincha Shakti and that in Achincha Shakti is such that it's very difficult to understand. We can see that Madhya Yashoda had taken a golden chain with bells and put it around the waist of baby Krishna. But then when he was naughty and broke the yogurt pot and she wanted to restrain him by making a baby harness from, from a rope, she put the rope around his waist but it was two inches too short she tied another rope another rope and for hours she was doing this and now the rope was very long but still it could not go around the waist of Krishna so simultaneously see Krishna by his yoga maya was showing that he was limited because the chain of bells golden chain of bells on his waist was containing him and at the same time many many ropes could not contain him so this is achintya mm -hmm. Krishna is born and he's also unborn. This is achintya. These subjects cannot be touched by mature intelligence of even great demigods and rishis. But Krishna is implying here that a devotee said, Oh my Lord, I am very tiny and insignificant. I cannot know you by my own power. So let me just try to serve you and please you by chanting your holy names Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare remembering your beautiful cowhood boy Swarup in Vrindavan remembering the supernatural mm, love of the residents of Vrindavan by which they always control you mm? Gopi Bisto Bito Nityak Bhagavan Balavat Kwachit mm. Shukadev Goswami says that Krishna in Vrindavan he's like a puppet in the hands Madhya Yashoda and the elderly gopis Krishna's aunts they they come Udgayanti Kotin Bhuk Das Tadvaso Daryantravat and they say to Krishna oh I'll give you some buttermilk hmm? if you do a dance 
And Krishna, like a puppet in the hands, is happily dancing and saying, give me the buttermilk. And he's drinking from the palm of the hands. Uh, but what is left over after churning the yogurt? It's quite astonishing. This is the power of brain. So the devotees remembering the sweet pastimes of Sri Krishna and chanting his name, then even though he cannot be understood by any devotees or rishis, then Krishna seeing that the devotees are very simple and very loving, kindly appears within the hearts of those devotees. That's the message of these verses. And now, next week we'll continue to explain the following verses, which are the prelude to Chatur Sloki Gita, that is, from verse 8 to th uh, 13, see Krishna 8, 9, 10 and 11. Mm. See Krishna will uh, begin to speak the Chatur Sloki Gita, the entire essence of Bhagavad Gita in only four verses. And these verses we're discussing now are the, the prelude to that. So everyone please join us next week for continuation of this discourse on Bhagavad Gita chapter 10. And uh, just now also there will be a Zoom conference for those who have applied. So we look forward to seeing you in the questions and answers. Hare Krishna. Bali Brindavan Bihar Lala Ki Jai Varasani Wali Ki Jai 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 Si Radhe Shama Gaur Premanan